Hello everyone, I'm Andrew Zorneman for Kane Academy. Welcome to this episode of The Best Books. Why should every high schooler read Plato's Republic? The Republic is Plato's second longest dialogue, ten times longer than the Apology. A single question, however, runs through all ten of the dialogue's books. That question is whether it is better to live justly or unjustly. It's the kind of question that every serious person needs to answer. It's one of those big questions that needs to be answered well. It's also a question that depends on the meaning of the key term, justice. And this is where things get messy. It turns out that there are competing claims to justice, which makes the question of how we live all the more difficult to answer. Plato stages his dialogue in the Piraeus, the great port that lies below Athens, about four and a half miles away from the city. It opens out to the sea and thus to the rest of the world. Like all great ports, the Piraeus is a meeting place of foreigners and natives, the familiar and the exotic, and the high stakes forged by the convergence of domestic and international politics, including a robust arms market. Plato's Republic puts the world on stage. It sets Athens next to all other polities, Socrates and his fellow Athenians alongside other societies. Like a great drama staged in the Athenian theater of Dionysus, Plato's great dialogue frees the careful reader to see what one ought to see, who we are and how we ought to live in society. The cast of characters is larger than most Platonic dialogues, but the central figure is familiar, Socrates, Plato's unlikely main character, old, bald, pug-nosed, and paunchy. Socrates spends his days teaching, but he takes no money for his work and is poor for it. The language of justice and right are consistently in his questions, yet he holds no political power, nor does he seek it. Socrates doesn't lecture. He asks a lot of difficult questions. He's likened, in fact, to a gadfly on the rump of a horse or a torpedo fish that numbs any creature it strikes. The questions are personal and public. Personal, since the student is under stiff scrutiny to let go of what is unexamined or false, even if he's held on to it for all his life. The questions are public, since most of the time Socrates probes his interlocutor out in the open, in the streets of Athens. They're also public, since how anyone answers has broader consequences for the well-being of the entire city. There's one more thing we need to know about the dramatic stage of Plato's Republic. By the end of the 5th century before Christ, a peculiar form of education had crept into the life of ancient Athens. The teachers were called sophists. What they taught was rhetoric. A sophist trained his student to be a rhetor, a political orator, a politician who uses speech to persuade others to his advantage. In Book One of Plato's Republic, Thrasymachus represents the sophist school of thought. When considering the chief question that runs through all of Plato's Republic, whether it is better to live justly or unjustly, Thrasymachus boldly asserts, justice is nothing other than the advantage of the stronger. Such a claim resounds through history, the militancy of those who claim that might makes right, that justice is the benefit of the stronger, that the rest of us just need to submit to the rule of the strong or suffer the consequences the stronger hold over our heads. Socrates defeats Thrasymachus through a series of questions that conclude logically in compelling counterpositions. Among other things, his exchange with the sophists demonstrates that if one does not rule the weak for their benefit, no matter how strong one is, rule by might will eventually turn out to the ruler's disadvantage. Thrasymachus is not right. It is not better to live unjustly, and justice is not the advantage of the stronger. Most importantly, Socrates shifts the dialogue to considerations of the soul. It becomes evident that if we're going to understand what justice is between the ruler and the ruled, we will need to understand the interior justice of the ruler. How does he govern himself? For how he does so will make all the difference for how he governs the city. The rest of Plato's Republic, books 2 through 10, is a deep and detailed dive into the relationship between the ruler and the city. Famously, Socrates says the politics is man writ large. The order of a just man is a benefit to the entire city, the seed of political justice. The disorder of an unjust man turns out to be the seed for disorder in a polity. The unjust soul, in other words, is the root cause of political injustice. Socrates doggedly leads his interlocutors to a place where they can freely choose justice over injustice. 
It is finally their choice, and how they are judged to death will finally be the fruit of how they live now. Along the way, Socrates uses questions, arguments, allegory, the terms and case studies proper to political science, and even myth, as he does at the end of Book 10. Plato's Republic, then, not only provides the map of personal and political justice, it provides an unprecedented range of ways by which the careful reader can see clearly what is difficult to see concerning justice. There is no better book for exploring the matter of justice. That's why every high schooler should read Plato's masterpiece. For a complete account of how to lead students through this best book, check out Kane Academy's guide, Leading a Seminar on Plato's Republic. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'll see you next time on The Best Books.